Hey everyone, Ben Cooper Radio, episode number 330. Now, over the years you've heard various different aspects of my story, what I've been up to, my background in fitness, why I did it, why I changed, and it was all because of my journey, was really fat, got thin, but before that I had uh, 10 years in the acting game, that was my passion, I loved the stage, I loved you know, playing characters and, you know, I have talked about in the past that actually was my love for that, that I wasn't actually self-confident as myself and actually it was just me trying to always be accepted by playing someone else because acting is a good way to do that. Um, actually, when I was an actor, I don't think I was actually that, that self-confident. When people think you're an actor, they assume you're self-confident because you exude this kind of energy, but you're kind of always playing someone else. Anyway, why am I talking about acting? I'm talking to someone today that also has a background uh, in acting, the theatre, the arts, expression, um, and has moved into the fitness industry. And we're going to hear all about that today. Today, hello, Mark Fisher. Hello, Ben. How are you from the Big Apple? Uh, I'm awesome, man. It's a beautiful, beautiful day here. It's the fall. I'm excited about the weather today. It's nice and sunny and crisp. That's what I love about the autumn. Crisp, clear, blue sky, fresh. You get the jacket on. Oh, yeah, I love it. Oh, man, it's amazing. We just moved in a new place, too. I wish I could show you the view. We have this like amazing 34 view of like all of southern Manhattan. It's really beautiful. Yeah. Wow. I've never been to New York, but I will. I'm planning on going there in the spring, hopefully, to do a seminar. So we will see. We will see. Nice. Um, right. People need to know who you are. Mark? Who are you? Yeah, the uh, the super short version is uh, my name is Mark. I run a very unconventional gym called Mark Fisher Fitness, which is one and soon to be two locations here in Manhattan in New York City. Uh, and our gym essentially um, caters to people that don't really like the gym. So our tagline is ridiculous humans, serious fitness. So we take the work very, very seriously but we do not take ourselves very seriously. So we don't call our, our clients members, we call them ninjas. And we don't really use the word gym, we call the Enchanted Ninja Clubhouse of Glory and Dreams. And our mascot is the unicorn, and the place looks like a, like a five-year-old dropped some LSD and then decorated. It's like a very eccentric place. Uh, where we're very serious about the fitness, but we just, we tend to attract a lot of people that are eccentric. <laughs> Uh, wow. Um, actually then, okay, so before we talk about your journey, I'm just intrigued about your gym. Like, if I walk to a, into a gym in the UK, I've got turnstiles, I've got reception, I've got gym floor, um, I don't really get any nutrition help. Like, what is your, what does, I suppose, a consumer feel when they walk into your gym, and what does fitness and nutrition look like in your gym? I'm intrigued. Yeah, so we, um, and I know there's some of these in the UK too, but so our facility uh, is, you probably wouldn't even call like an open access gym anyway. So for instance, there's no one that pays a monthly fee and can just come in and do stuff on their own. So it's a coaching centric facility. Mm -hmm. So essentially anybody that comes in is going to be working with a coach. And there's a couple different things we do. We have classes and more of a small group training model. We also do um, a transformation program six times a year that is also very nutrition intensive. But ostensibly, there's no one who just comes in and like rents the equipment. Everyone who's coming in is always working with a coach whenever they're at Mark Fisher Fitness. Okay. Um, I really, really value this movement in fitness that's currently happening. Um, our gym in Ipswich is the same, small group training. The results you get is so much better. Yes, you've got to commit more money. You might pay twice, maybe three times as much as a monthly membership where you turn up. But, you know, you get guidance, you get results. But, you know, I, if you're listening to this and if you are a little bit stuck on your fitness journey, go and find these one, one of these gyms, which is exactly what Mark's doing. Um, so, Mark, I'm intrigued by your journey. Uh, this podcast is so much about learning from others that have done great things but have had roadblocks um, in their journey, whether that's health, fitness, training, strength, hypertrophy, fat loss, loads of different stuff. So take as much time as you want. Talk to me about your fitness journey because there's been quite a lot of evolution and I want to share that with people. Yeah. Yeah, so my my story is, you know, I was, 
I was like to share that a lot of people in the fitness industry, um, understandably, there's a lot of people that come from a world of sports, right? And sports are totally cool, but like I was not someone that came from a world of sports. So, uh, you know, I always joke when I was a little kid, um, I tried to pay attention to sports and I tried to play sports, but I would just get like bright red in the face because I didn't sweat. So I would just like get a headache and I have to go lie inside by my mom. Right. So like I, I tried playing sports, but I was like that kid. Um, and, uh, you know, as happens when you're that kid, you do the theater because theater is the opposite of sports. Right. I'm not physically exerting myself. Um, I'm having an opportunity to uh, get to play pretend, pretend like I'm other people. Um, and I sort of found my tribe. Right. I found my people. But, you know, I'm a human and I have a body. And uh, the reality is, you know, once I got in high school, um, I really uh, got to a place where my frustration with my body and ultimately my desire that, like, maybe girls would make out with me, um, that desire was stronger than my fear of going to the gym. And I think a lot of my approach to training nutrition to this day really comes out of the fact that when I first joined the gym, it was like a nightmare for me. It was not something that I, uh, you know, was naturally looking forward to. And I can just remember being like, of all the places in my life where I had felt like I had not fit in, this place was like exquisite, particularly because, you know, I did, I didn't have access to like a, a training centric studio. It was just like me literally by myself in this gym full of these large men in jeans and flannels and work boots. The first three months or six months, even if you don't quite know what you're doing, you're usually going to see some movement and some results. And, uh, you know, sure enough, it's funny, like, because now I look back on it, I probably went from a buck 35 to 140 pounds. So I don't know what that would be in kilos, but that's very thin for five foot 10 person. Yeah. But, you know, for me, those extra two kilos were like, I'm the man, I'm so muscular, this is amazing. And, uh, you know, it's the beginning of me, once I started seeing that positive feedback loop, uh, the gym became something, it was like just 1% more tolerable. And then I think, you know, after I graduated high school, I went to, uh, you know, university and worked out on and off. And it took me probably about five years before I got really, really consistent with it. But what was so interesting was once I got to New York City, I found that I could control like anything in New York. New York is a very daunting place. I was an actor. I couldn't control getting jobs lots of the time. Uh, I never had any money. I still found girls very daunting, intimidating at this point. But weirdly, the gym became the one thing I could count on. So I found myself falling in love with the process of training, falling in love with reading about nutrition and program design, and I got really, really, really into it. And it was, to this day, I think it's like the greatest, like most magical thing in my life to appreciate the thing that was representative of everything that I hated about myself as like a kid became the one sanctuary in my life throughout my 20s during what was often tough times sometimes. And during this time, because I like to share and I like to teach and I like to give information about things I'm passionate about, I started working with a lot of people, particularly in the Broadway community. Oh, yeah. and, what I, and what I found was I seemed to have a knack for taking um, often staid but rigorous information and making it kind of entertaining to my community because my community of people – and not just the fitness industry, but I think anybody that doesn't feel like an athlete that didn't feel spoken to by the fitness industry, they still want fitness, right? They still want to feel good about their body, but there was just no one really speaking to them, I think, in ways that like were, were attractive to them that made it fun and accessible. And that's really what I prided myself in. Um, and then, you know, the sort of, I guess, the, the button on the story is, you know, finally at a certain point, I realized that I was like, maybe ready to do something besides acting, but I just couldn't imagine myself leaving my community. And uh, I was like, all right, well, what if I try to put a little bit of effort into the business of training? Because mostly I had been an actor who trained on the side. Um, and then sure enough, literally within nine months, um, I had like, stopped auditioning. My best friend from, from my high school community theater group quit his job, lit his life on fire, moved to New York City. We got a lease. We hired a couple trainers. And it was like, add water, and now you're business. So very, very quickly it went from 
you know, just a one man band to like an actual like facility in a business. Wow. And that is my story. Um, now I'm going to kind of come onto this in an open way later, but you know, many people in their journey face problems and you made an incredible point that I often talk about in my seminars in that you had to create a desire and a reason and a why to not go to the gym. So you didn't like the gym. It wasn't really initially a place for you to be, but the desire to get chicks, be buff, all that stuff was greater <laughs> yeah. than not to go. So what advice do you give people that were almost trying to search for that reason to do something positive over negative, which might be as simple as eat the cookie, don't eat the cookie? Yeah, you know, I, I think for me, you know, it's funny you say that. So we have a six week transformation program we do at Mark Fisher Fitness. Um, and we try to get really like make things as simple as possible for people. And like the core foundation of that program is getting deep, deep clarity around why it is that you want to have fitness in the first place. Because it's very common. People will often sign up for a program. And, and to my mind, you know, it, it can be a tough thing because we're, you know, motivation is always multifactorial, right? Which is to say there's always like a number of reasons why we're doing something and, and motivation is very complex. But I think for most people, if you haven't spent the time really digging in uh, and going through, uh, you know, the five whys, you know, uh, technique, which might be something you're familiar with, where you literally just keep asking over and over, okay, so why is it you want health and fitness? Oh, because I want to, I want to feel better in my jeans. Okay. Why do you want to feel better in your jeans? And then essentially you continue that process to really dig in deep and get the underlying reason. To my mind, without that level of clarity, it is very hard to create sustainable change. Because when you're looking to change habits, that's a hard thing to do. And if you don't have, you know, as uh, Nietzsche said, uh, one can bear almost any how if you have a strong enough why. Mm -hmm. And oftentimes there's people, I think, when they're beginning their journey – um, it, it seems like it wouldn't be important, but to me, it's really putting first things first. You've got to really get clear around what it is you're looking for. How is it going to affect your life when you achieve your health and fitness goals? And I think within reason, you know, I think there's something to be said for also asking you, you know, what is it costing you right now in your life? that you don't have the levels of health and fitness you want. And I would caution as, as like sort of a, a social science nerd, um, we've seen pretty consistently People tend to do better over the long haul, moving towards uh, a new vision of themselves, what could be called the ideal self, as opposed to moving away from something, right? And oftentimes, and I'm sure you've seen this too, uh, another thing that is not wrong, but I know from the outset it's going to be something we'll need to address. When someone is using health and fitness to try to fix something that's broken, it, it that's often not going to be a sustainable thing, right? And that's a perfectly normal part of the process for many people because I think we often understand who we are and what we want by getting some clarity around what we don't want and who we don't want to be. And I think that's a useful part of the process. But at a certain point, we have to shift away from I'm working out because I don't like my body and I'm, these, these things I don't like about myself – you got to sort of hold the other end of the stick and get clarity around what is the why, what is my life going to look like, who am I going to be, how am I going to show up for the people in my life that I love if I'm able to achieve this new and, and better vision of myself that I, I want to create. Do you think as you age, you need the same level and desire and why, or it does become habit? The reason why I ask is you've been training, let's just say 15, 20 years, your why now is different to your why before. Do you still have to keep reprogramming your whys or do you just do it out of habit? Do you just keep going to the gym the same five days a week or whatever? Yeah, it's, it's such a great question, man. I, I mean, I do think, you know, there is something to be said for once someone really ingrains the habits, it becomes such a part of who you are that I, I do think for a lot of people, you know, I suspect, you know, the training is no longer about this clear, like, goal they're moving forward. It's just about the process because I'm the type of person that works out, right? I've written a story of my identity and my identity of who I am. I am someone that values health and fitness. Um, having said that, I do find, because, you know, listen, like, I'm, you know, 
like you said, I've been in the game a long time, man. And at this point, it's it's not about chicks anymore, right? <laughs> like, I'm, I'm getting married. I won. I got, I got a great girl who will make out with me, right? So for me, um, I have in the past few years had, I think, to uh, – to sort of re-explore what it is I'm doing this for. Because at this point, listen, I still like to look good. I think, you know, there, you know, I come from a background that really prides aesthetics. I don't come from performance. But at the end of the day, for me at this point, um, I am very persuaded by the effects of health and fitness on like my brain and who I am. Right. And and for me, my health and fitness is very entwined to my life mission which is, is broader than health and fitness, which is really how can I make the maximum positive impact on the world before I die, right? How can I really look to, to lift up uh, the, the ninjas in Mark Fisher Fitness, my team around me and everyone I know, and I know that if I'm not taking care of my body, um, that, that's just not going to happen. You know, and the aesthetic stuff is nice too, but for me, it's really about brain functioning. It's about understanding uh, exercise ability to uh, – positively affect uh, or, or prevent cognitive decline as we age. Uh, there's obviously a lot of mood elevating things around it. And, uh, you know, at this point, it's, I have to say, like, it's funny. If I do go a while where I'm not taking care of my body, if I, like, you know, miss a few workouts, you know, I can't tell you if it's a placebo effect or not, but, like, I, I don't feel right. I don't feel good about myself the way if I'm, like, exerting myself. Now, I can imagine you're in, in your experience, you'll hopefully share my thought, and this is something that I've been talking about in a recent seminar series I've been doing, in that fitness, we always, uh, we have this accumulation mindset in that all we ever do is add, 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 add as we gain experience, knowledge. So people, you might have done this, you start training three days a week, then four days a week, then five days a week, and then shit, you're a ninja now, you can train six days a week. And then actually, that has potentially a positive effect on body composition, muscle mass, but it now starts to have a negative effect on mind, body, energy, relationship. So, you know, we're, we're now looking at this reprogramming your why in that we need to get away from that obsessive aesthetic side of it and say, because for me now at 30... I want to look good naked, but I know I can look good naked training realistically two, three times a week. Three, four ideally, but two, three times a week. Because my why is now that, do you know what? I want quality of life. I want to focus on my business, my loved ones. But I think people really struggle with that transition. Yeah, it, it does seem that, you know, it, it's interesting. Um, you know, I was this weekend, I was hanging out with a buddy of mine, um, a guy in the States uh, named John Romanello, um, real, real bright guy. Uh, and he, you know, made the point that for a lot of people that like really, really get into fitness, and I don't know if this is necessary, but it does seem a lot of people go through a period of like almost like obsessiveness. Um, which ultimately like is not, <laughs> it's not the long haul game, you know, and it's like funny too, cause I, you know, I suspect it sounds like you maybe have the similar situation with a lot of your clientele. So I'm in New York city, right? So New Yorkers do not understand that more is not always better, right? Like, like they're like, more is always better. The more I can do, um, is better. And it's interesting in Mark Fisher fitness, believe it or not, we've had moments of like really intense um, challenges sometimes with some clients getting like convince them to not train every day because we actually have a rule that you can't train every day, right? And 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 we actually got rid of an unlimited membership we had because it was too hard to track people because a lot of people would just come in all the time. And to your point, you know, if the goal is just to work out all the time, then I guess it's okay. But for most of us, we're working out so that we can have a high quality of life, achieve our professional objectives, um, hopefully really show up for our communities in a really powerful way. Um, and like I said, it does seem that, that that's a common thing for people to go through. Um, but, you know, and I would even make the case, so even just from a physiological perspective, more is not better, right? We're looking to balance stressors. And if we're constantly training a super high level intensity all the time and going in, uh, you know, even if your technique is great, you're just going to be adding unnecessary wear and tear in your joints where it seems there's a point where it's a real law of diminishing returns, mm. right? And where is that law of diminishing returns? I don't know. Like, I don't know. I guess like, you know, to me, it seems like uh, after four, you know, maybe after five. Um, certainly once we're up to six times a week at that point, um, it's not wrong, but like I was telling the ninjas at that point, I would just rather you call your mom and tell her you love her, 
right? Like if you really want to be a happy person, like work out one less hour and just call your mom. You don't call your mom enough. Tell your mom, I need to call my mom tour. I love my mom, right? Don't work out. Go call your mom. <laughs> like, I promise. And you'll get better results because you'll be like calmer, you know? Mm. Cause I think that's the other thing too, that's symptomatic of someone training that much. Um, we're like in this fight or flight thing of just like more, 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 more. Um, and you almost have to get to the point, I think with your fitness and nutrition, where you just can't hold it too tight. You have to be a little less precious about it, particularly when you're looking for, you know, general fitness, like, you know, general, like health and hotness, as we call it, Mark Fisher fitness that's balanced for the rest of your life. And for sure, listen, if you're a bodybuilder, that's obviously a very different thing because that's your career, but that's not really the clientele I work with. You know, I'm looking with people that like, you know, want like to balance their health and fitness with living a full life. And none of us are long for this world. Exactly. So it's, a, it's now about getting really clear with the why and the outcome. If you want to be a bodybuilder, then cool, there's a path to that. And Great. if you yeah. think you've got the physical potential, then brilliant, do it. But, you know, a lot of us are looking up to people in the fitness industry. Let's say, let's say I watched, um, uh, what's, what's his name? The, the most famous CrossFitter. Shit, what's his name? I do not know much about CrossFit, hilarious. Oh, anyway, he's like the best CrossFit in the world. He's labeled the world's fittest man. And um, there's a video, uh, a documentary of him on Netflix. And he trains like three times a day. He's uh, yeah, a complete yeah, and yeah. utter beast. Now, we look yeah. at that and think, well, that's the ideal. If I want to be in that kind of shape, then that is the ideal. But context, he's trying to be the fittest man on earth. If you want to be yeah, that guy, yeah, then yeah, 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 yeah. But if you want to be pretty jacked, be good with your family, you know, be happy and healthy, four to five days a week for an hour is cool. Don't worry about it. It is yeah, definitely yeah. cool. Even, even as far as like, you know, like the amount of loads people are lifting or the variation of exercises, right? Because again, my, you know, interestingly enough, a lot of my professional education, particularly when it comes to training, comes from sports performance. Um, and I definitely have had moments in my career where I, I, I look back now and I think I maybe had like a more of a strength bias than was necessary for general fitness population. But like when people come in, and I, and I get a part of it too, particularly with my world, right? So we call our clients, and I mean this in the best way possible, like the Isle of Misfit Toys, right? I don't know if you guys have like Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer in, in the UK, but it was just like, you know, they, they found like this island of like toys that like didn't quite fit in. And a lot of my ninjas, I know on some level, we, we all kind of feel like that, right? And because we didn't have good experiences with training growing up, sometimes we didn't feel athletic. Sometimes it's a bummer when we're trying to do like a push up and like you come in to Mark Fisher Fitness, we try to, we're pretty intense about the technique. We're like, okay, you're not ready to do that yet. That's not really what we're looking for. Um, and in my mind, that's only an issue if your goal is to be push-up champion of the world, right? If you want to be push-up champion, then you should feel badly. But if you're just trying to, like, have sex, find a husband, not die young or get on Broadway, then it doesn't really matter what variation you're doing, you know? So to your point, I think there's also, you know, this interesting balance of keeping the goal the goal, as Dan John, one of my mentors, would say, right? What is the goal here, right? And oftentimes, when the goal is, you know, we start this, like, fitness goal to get into that why, um, you know, sometimes in this process of obsessiveness, we lose sight of the goal and start chasing other things that ultimately I don't know are going to meaningfully affect our life um, in a way that will serve us best. But mm. coming back, yeah. So I'm gonna. I'll tell you what. I'm gonna finish up on this point of a goal because actually I flew to Ireland a couple of days ago and did a seminar in Ireland. And um, before the seminar, I try and go around the room and ask everyone uh, who they are, what they do, what they're into, and what they want to learn today, so I can get an idea of the room. And there was probably about 30 to 40% of the room that said they were into powerlifting. And I thought that was really interesting. Interesting. So what I see currently in fitness right now is powerlifting is probably the most on-trend thing. And that's because a mm. result of people like Lane Norton mm. having transitioned from bodybuilding into powerlifting. And a lot of this information coming out saying, look, if you train the whole body consistently with progressive overload regularly, you're going to get benefit. And I kind of looked at powerlifting and I thought, I can't think of anything worse of a training medallion for me personally with powerlifting. It's three core exercises, sounds quite boring, and it's actually quite high risk. You know, I'm lifting at three RM and below. Um, I'm focusing on the deadlift. Uh, I don't even like squatting because my hip flexors are always junk because I sit down half the day. And I wonder with that amount of people in the room, you know, does that fit the goal? Does powerlifting genuinely fit the goal when most people want yeah. to be happy, fit, healthy, look good naked? 
Yeah, it's it, it's such a great point, man. We definitely like uh, you know, and and like I said, I think a lot of the, particularly in the states, I can say a lot of our best gyms, like you know, because a lot of us have that background, and most of us have you know. I think believe, and, and I think this is right, right? You need a certain amount of strength as like a base for like a lot of stuff, right? And I think based on your background, um, you know, sometimes I, I don't know how strong a general population person needs to be, right? And in sports performance, you see this debate a lot, right? How strong do you need to get someone to be, you know, for them to be like a quarterback, right? A football team, right? And there's all these different standards. But for general population person, I don't know. And this is like really like kind of controversial to say. And a lot of like my sports, even like some of my best friends are like, what? I'm like, I don't really care if my guys can't deadlift 225. Like, are they moving well? Are they feeling good? Are they looking well? But I think what happens is people understandably want, I think, progression. They, you know, gamification is a big term right now in a lot of fields. And powerlifting does allow you to get a little bit more gamified. But again, it's not always the, the right fit for some people. You know, and I can say, again, I had that phase, right? I've done all the things, right? Think of a thing that's not ideal. I've done it. And for me, it just beat me up. I have, I have the joints of like a 12 year old girl, you know, like I did the best I could, but like, I just found myself getting beat up and like not feeling good. I was like eating, you know, and I was like, and these, there's nothing wrong with this if you're a power lifter, right? But like, I'm breeding lead FTS. I'm like, I got to eat a pizza and put olive oil on it. Cause that's the way power lifters get big. And then, like at a certain point, where I was like, "No, wait, I don't, I don't like the way I feel. I don't like the way I look right now." Um, even though I never really look like a powerlifter, let's be honest. Um, <laughs> but I think you know, and and I understand why it happens. This happens even in MFF with our ninjas. Is you know they 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 achieve a certain amount of aesthetic, you know, success, or they decide they're content with where they're at based on how they're willing to eat, which is totally cool. And then they're like, "Okay, what's next? What's next? What's next?" And a lot of them, you know, start to chase strength goals, which, which to a point is, is really useful. But, um, but I do think there's a point where, you know, you lose sight of the goal being the goal and then you're like powerlifting, which is again, not necessarily wrong, but if the goal is just generally feeling good, looking good naked and being happy about your health, uh, you know, I would suggest there may be some other ways to do it. There may be some other ways to do it. Mm. Now this makes a beautiful segue into my next question which is kind of around identity now from mm. what i see in fitness a lot of people do struggle with identity and if you're a crossfitter a powerlifter a bodybuilder a rugby player whatever you have an identity and a lot of people potentially need that now i know that you have a side project called business for unicorns and unicorn is this kind of word to be unique be yourself yeah why do you think a lot of people struggle to be their own unicorn? Yeah, I think it's because it's just the, the nature of the nature of humans is I think we we are often um, have a moment of ignition where we are inspired to create a better vision of ourselves by by looking around us and seeing something that we want to model, right? So there's an amazing book called the Talent Code, which is sort of exploration of how people get better at things. One of the points they make they make is often the first step on the road to mastery for any field is this moment the author calls ignition, where you see someone doing something and sort of like sparks your imagination, catches your eye and inspires you to start moving towards that because in your heart, you're like, that could be me. Like I, I could do that. That might be me. And because of that, I think it's like a very, again, normal part of the process for people to find, uh, new role models and, uh, and certainly to find communities to join. I think that's like really awesome. But yeah, sometimes again, it can be challenging and ultimately like you know, you're, you're a unique snowflake, you know, and without getting like in a real like philosophical uh, academic tangent, it is something I think a lot about, right? What is the balance between individual self-expression versus being a part of being mindful of a community and showing up for the people around you? Um, and again, I, I don't know that, you know, it's necessarily like wrong to model others, but I think certainly... Yeah, at the end game, you know, I think the hardest thing to do in life is really get clear about listening around, like, who you are and what it is that you want to do. Because I would make the point that we all have, I really believe, an obligation to get clear around what it is that unique about us. Because we are the only person ever 
that will have the opportunity to share our particular talents, our particular skill sets, the things that make us different, the things that make us weird, the things that even make us a little bit broken, that we have an obligation to share that with the world. So if we're trying to be other people, I, I think maybe we lose some of that. Maybe we lose some of that. And to me, like that's a tragedy because we're the only chance that the universe will ever have for us to express itself through us. Mm -hmm. um, and like that's something that like I think about a lot and it's not easy and I'm not saying I'm perfect at it, or I never have days where like I either doubt myself or maybe catch myself like trying to keep up with the Joneses in some way but it, it is something that I, I do think a lot about and it's something I really aspire to and something I think at Mark Fisher Fitness um, you know we try to be you know a community of, of individuals right so we try to be like we're a community we're together but man we're all we're all like unicorns we're all doing our own thing following our own star mm. Surely it's like knowledge accumulation, like everything that I've talked about in my podcast, in my world, I don't want everyone to take that on board and it become them. People need to sure. take on board what is relevant for them, make it their sure. own, make their own expression of it. So sure, you can look at a CrossFitter and say, I am inspired by that type of training. I'm inspired by, oh, Rich Fronin, that's it, Rich Fronin's Netflix oh, okay. documentary, yeah. very good. I'm inspired by Rich, but I now have to make that relevant to me, my goals and my why, but I think part of me would be happy with an expression of some of those characteristics and habits. Yeah. Yeah, and I think that you're absolutely that you hit the nail on the head there, right? It's like what can you pull from it to inspire and what pieces of it can can you really like actually integrate without losing yourself, yeah. So moving on um, now, I think you're incredibly humble and giving comparatively to the fitness industry. I, th I don't think it's a trait that we, oh, see, yeah. that we see enough of in fitness, especially in the UK. It might be different in, in, in uh, America, but I, it is changing, but I see fitness as having a lot of ego, a lot of elitism, and I, I think that's quite an untouchable thing for a lot of people. It makes people feel it kind of makes fitness feel unobtainable for a lot of people. And I think that's a bad place to be in. Now I see that shift happening in fitness just out of interest. What shifts do you see happening in fitness right now from what we're doing as top line people to how the consumer is kind of going on their own journey and what I suppose do you hope to see over the next couple of years for some of the things that you dislike in fitness? Yeah, I think that, the, the biggest shift that I've seen here in the States in the past five years, which has been very dramatic, I think is an understanding that for fitness professionals, that really like understanding uh, the basics of nutrition and the basics of training is just like really just the first step to the door that like so much of the work is like how to help people do the things that they like are actually looking to do. And my dream for uh, fitness consumers, my dream for fitness consumers is that like as an industry, we can do a better job of marketing reality, I guess, which is to say, because you know, the, the inherent challenge we run into, um, you know, and we get this because, you know, we understand business, right? It's like oftentimes what is most marketable and most exciting is not always, uh, necessarily, frankly, in people's best interest. So that in the States, what, what has been interesting is it does seem that for instance, we, uh, a lot of the major events, it's been really interesting because even five, six years ago, you would go in and it would only be about program design. It would only be about sets and reps. It would only be about like foot anatomy, right? Or, you know, various like macro setups. And again, those things are awesome. You need those things. Whereas it seems at least among a lot of my pals that I would consider like the really like best people in the States, um, we just saw that it didn't work. And I was that dude too, so I'm not judging. Like, I, because like again, I came from um, not really a bodybuilder background, but, but kind of like that was how I got into it. So for me, when I started training people, I was like, I'm the best because I know what your macros need to be. Do your macros and do your program. I'm the best. And then if people didn't do it, I was like, I don't know what to do now. They didn't do the thing, right? But like, I know what to do, right? So, you know, it was, it's been very interesting. You know, I look back on that now. My friend, my friend Steve Ledbetter, 
Um, you know, he has this uh, great story he talks about. He's like, when I first started training people, like I realized like I was working with a client and I knew like what she needed to do and that was all I knew. Like I didn't, I didn't have any tools other than like I knew what she was needing to do. So I think there's, there's a greater emphasis I think on psychology and on how to really help people create uh, new sustainable behaviors that I personally am like very inspired by. And not only that, frankly, it's going to lead to, you know, that type of stuff is going to lead to like vastly improved quality of life for individuals, which leads to vastly improved quality of life for our societies. And by the way, better businesses, because if you're able to convince people to stick around, like you have clients longer, right? And, and that's like, you know, that's not why we get into this, why we get into business, but man, like, you know, it's it's worth it to, to point out you're not going to have a very successful business as a fit pro if like every three months people are bailing on you because you just can't convince – you can't help someone move towards these goals. that In their heart, they, they really want to get to and they just need help and it's more than just telling them what to do. It's like really getting on their agenda, learning how to ask the right kind of questions and you know, really looking like – you know, to really stand with them and sort of serve them and, and be a servant. So, I mean our conversation today summarizing – Basics are key. We know that. And I, I love the fact that almost America has realized that because in my early teachings of health and fitness, I followed a lot of American trainers and it, it can be, it used to be so extreme. Like paleo is the best. So if extreme. you don't do it, you'll die. So extreme. Yeah. yeah. And it was sort of, the, it's, it's like the Bruce Lee thing, right? It's like before I studied uh, martial arts, a punch was just a punch. Then when I studied martial arts, a punch was no longer just a punch. But then once I like really mastered martial arts, a punch was just a punch again, mm -hmm. right? And and you're right. I think the whole industry, and you know, went through this period, and, and I think we still are, right? Because it's you can't speak about it. you know we're we're not a homogeneous mass. We're all different. But there's a moment I think in most fitness professionals' career and in nutrition and and consumers, right, where like you know so much that you're dangerous. And you're like overthinking things. But then when you're in the game long enough, you begin to see the things that like actually matter. And it becomes not about what you can add. It becomes about what you can take away. Mm -hmm. And the reality is, you know, it, you're, we're always going to have these people that we look up to, the, the stars of our industry that are great because they're brilliant at the minutia, because they know the details that will matter if you're looking to go from an 850-pound deadlift to a 900-pound deadlift, right? The details at that point, they really, really matter. But for a lot of people that I work with, a lot of people just looking for general health and fitness, um, I think that's, if anything, that's what I think we're looking to help them with is get clear around the things that matter and the things that don't. Because that's almost definitionally the difference between sort of the amateur and the professional is an amateur can't understand, can't prioritize the differences, right? They can't understand what is me if they're going to move it. And I believe that the job as a coach, as a trainer is again, just like with like unconditional positive regard and just like aggressive love and acceptance, just gently hold them by the hand and keep bringing them back to the handful of things, the basics that are actually meaningfully going to impact their success. Mm. I love that. So true. Um, right, Mark, we'd better wrap up um, because I have to fly out the door. We uh, we had a little bit of a Google mare before we started this, um, <laughs> and we've come to the conclusion that due to Google's failure, um, Mark says I will uh, earn a million pounds off suing Google. So I need yeah. to go and sue Google. Um, but Mark, I want to, there's various things that you do. Um, I know you've got communities that help people and the people that are listening today that you can help, I'd like to give them an opportunity to be helped by you. Um, so let firstly, let people know where they can find you online if they want to follow um, your crazy stuff and the stuff yeah. that you can help people with, please tell them where to go and what they will experience from going to that place. For sure. So the the first stop, if you're looking for me online, because I do have a lot of homes, as Ben mentioned, uh, is markfisherhumanbeing.com. Markfisherhumanbeing.com. And that's where you'll find the links to all the various uh, business ventures I got going on. Um, for people that are interested in uh, learning more about what Mark Fisher Fitness does, you can find us at markfisherfitness.com. Uh, we do have an online uh, streaming uh, workout site for people that like 
If you might find uh, crazy people the appropriate fit for your training, you can check us out at mybroadwaybody.com, which is actually a site we developed. Yeah, for performers, um, and it's an online uh, membership site that has uh, high definition streaming workouts with yours truly. We have a great community on there. We have nutrition coaching. So if anyone's interested in that, uh, we call it My Broadway Body because we're niched towards performers, but we definitely have a lot of non-performers on there as well. Um, and lastly, for any uh, fitness professionals listening, uh, the main thing I do these days is I do a lot of work actually with uh, the business of fitness, uh, with trainers at facilities looking to really grow their biz. Uh, and that can all be found at businessforunicorns.com, businessforunicorns.com. Um, and I would highly recommend checking that out. I've read some of your blogs. They are fantastic. Your business partner as well, who Sorry. also gets involved in the blogs. Yeah. Um, and when this podcast goes live, which is Thursday, I will actually be seeing you for a day uh, with Strength Matters on the Friday. So I will get an intensive view of what is Business for Unicorns. So if you're a personal trainer out there, Check out Business for Unicorns. Um, highly recommend it. Even if you get as far as the blog, you're going to pick up some advice. Otherwise, check out MarkFisherHumanBeing.com. Mark, where do you where where's like the best social media platform to follow you? Is it Snapchat, Facebook? What's the, the cool place? Yeah, the best one is definitely uh, on Facebook. I have to apologize. I like I'm at that five thousand mark. So, but. Um, let's not let Facebook decide if we can be friends. You go ahead and you follow me and we will buck the system. Uh, but that, that's definitely the place I'm most active. So come find me on that Facebook. Awesome. All right. Well, Mark, it's been incredible to have you on. I really appreciate the time you've given to everyone today. So thank you. Um, what you're doing in fitness is fantastic. I'll continue to follow you. I'm excited about seeing you again tomorrow. We hooked up properly and shook hands at LIW, which was great. Um, and yeah, all the best with everything. And if you ever need anything, you know where we are, but I'm sure uh, everyone will get involved on the podcast and reach out to you and say thank you, maybe share some thoughts with you on the social uh, media space. Um, and for anyone that is listening, if you've enjoyed the show, please leave us a review on iTunes, say something. That's how these shows grow. They don't just grow by themselves. If you've liked it, and you see it on Facebook, give it a share, tag a friend in who you think might be struggling with some of the things that we've talked about today. This is free information, it's here to help people. Please help me and Mark help other people. Mark, that's it, it's time for us to say goodbye. A true pleasure. <laughs> see you Mark, and for everyone listening, I will see you next week. Ciao. I'm on my own because uh, I've been flying around the country on the tour. I haven't really got myself organised with a guest. And I thought, Do you know what? It's been a little while 